So it was seventh grade. And I remember walking across the fields to uh, my mom's car with my head hung low. I had my bags on my back, and I get into the car after two weeks of baseball tryouts, and I unwillingly have to tell my mom that I did not make the team. And from that moment on, I never thought about baseball again. Her response to me, just like any loving parent would, uh, as I sit there with my head down and not wanting to see that for her child, she says to me, Ryan, that's okay. They don't know what they're missing out on. In that moment, I feel loved and and encouraged. And I'm like, that's right. They don't don't know what they're missing out on. Um, But have you been there before? You've been left off of a roster, you've been cut from something, you weren't invited to something, whatever it is, it potentially could have communicated to you that you were not enough. In our culture of, um, especially right now in the last number of years, of just really pursuing self-esteem at all costs, that we can um, have this worth no matter what other people are saying, Embrace you, but this morning I want you to hear the words that you are not enough. That you actually are not enough. And just sit with that for a second. Like if, if someone just walks up to you and tells you, you know what, you're not enough. How does that feel? What do you do with that? <laughs> Jason said terrible. <laughs> it feels terrible. You're not enough. But just sit in that for a second. So while this little piece and intro is much more nuanced than how I deliver it, uh, I think it's important to look at this through the lens of relationships. And as we do step into this new series of counterintuitive connections, we want to look at spiritual wisdom from the Bible for messy relationships over the next six weeks. And this may or may not sound highly counterintuitive to you, that you are not enough. Um, And I think however you hear it this morning, and either way you look at that, uh, when I say you're not enough, there's probably a number of things where you might actually cringe. That I I don't like hearing that. And I think two of the primary ways um, in which it probably confronts us is that either we've heard that we are enough our entire life. We have had loving people around us and encouraging people around us, and they have said that you are enough, you are enough, no one can tell you that you're not. Uh, We probably see this lived out mostly in American Idol, uh, where there are clearly some people that should have been told at one point, you know what, you can't sing. You're actually not enough to go up there on the stage and do this, but that's tangent. Or the other reality of why you might cringe to this is that you have been told your entire life that you're not enough. for so many reasons that people have told you that your life will amount to nothing. Um, and, and in a weird way, in both of those, I'm sorry, especially for the second one. Uh, I, I don't intend any of this or um, where we're at in life, I, I, I don't think it's ever helpful to tell anyone that they are not enough. Um, but for both of those, uh, I, I know for me it's a little bit of a mix. I can look back at my story, and there's times when I have been told I'm enough and it's been good. It's also been um, not as helpful as the person may have been trying to deliver. There's also been moments in my life where I've been told I'm not enough. And I think in some ways that's been damaging. In other ways, that's actually been constructive and, and pushed me forward. So I, we, we definitely see a mixed bag here. But through the lens of relationships, this idea that you are enough. I think can lead to a false narrative for us that can be more destructive than good in the long run. Because in relationships especially, oftentimes what you believe of yourself is what you believe of others. What you hold yourself to, you hold others to. And sometimes you even hold other people to it more than you hold it to yourself. The way you do things is how others should do things. What you believe is what your friends should believe. How you parent is how your siblings should parent. Who you vote for is who your family should vote for. The list can go on and on and on. And if you are enough, others should be enough. And in relationships, this false narrative begins to play out is that you are enough for each other's fulfillment. For your family, for your friends, for your spouse, for your, I mean, go on and on and on. The narrative says that you are enough for each other's fulfillment. I mean, you can hear it in the wedding vows. You 
completely. But isn't it true of all relationships? This idea that you complete me. That when I have children that I've been longing for, they are going to complete me. When I meet the right person and find marriage, then I will be complete. When my dad finally apologizes, or when my mom starts treating me like an adult, then I will be fulfilled. But when these things don't happen, when others don't live up to our standards of them fulfilling or completing us, when our best friend lies to us, when our spouse fill in the blank, when our kids are misbehaving, when my parents fill in the blank, where does it end? If I believe that I'm enough for others, that I am just fully, that I fully complete them, and I, am I expecting others to also fully complete me? There's this moment in scripture where Paul, uh, one of our early church planners, writes to a church in the city of Corinth. And he's giving an, an instruction, some on behalf of himself, some on behalf of God, that he says, uh, and he says in, rega- in regard to marriage, this in 1 Corinthians 7, 8 to 13. Now to the unmarried and the widows, I say, it is good for them to stay unmarried as I do. But if they cannot control themselves, they should marry. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. To the married, I give this command, not I, but the Lord. A wife must not separate from her husband. But if she does, she must remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband. And a husband must not divorce his wife. To the rest, I say this, I, not the Lord. If any brother has a wife who is not a believer and she is willing to live with him, he must not divorce her. And if a woman has a husband who is not a believer and he is willing to live with her, she must not divorce him. If you're feeling confused right now, it's okay. For the unbelieving husband has been sanctified through his wife and the unbelieving wife has been sanctified through her believing husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean. But as it is, they are holy. But if the unbeliever leaves, let it be so. The brother or the sister is not bound in such circumstances. God has called us to live in peace. How do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? Even with marriage, the relationship in which our culture upholds to this idea that this is full completion for each other, the end-all, be-all of relationships, others are not there for our ultimate fulfillment. He even goes on later to say, in a few verses later, for some, don't marry because it's going to distract you from your life with God. Relationships matter. I do want to say, and they are so important. Relationships are so important, and God desi- designed us for connection. But what happens is if we don't actually connect to the way that we were designed to our Creator, we're going to seek connection and fulfillment elsewhere. And the next place we oftentimes go is to relationships. And I think in all of this, no human being can be enough for your completion. In every relationship, we actually have an opportunity to love like Jesus does, even amidst the shortcomings of those that we're in relationship with. Loving ourselves, even amidst our own shortcomings. Because isn't it in relationships where we find out our own shortcomings? Here's a thought. Fulfillment isn't found in your relationships relationships are where your fulfillment is displayed. Fulfillment is not found in your relationships. Relationships are where your fulfillment is displayed. When I'm freed from being the fulfillment or finding fulfillment in, then I can appreciate the gifts that they offer me. I can look at the positives, I can look at the good, and I can release them from the shortcomings, the things that do not fully complete me, the things that I don't find ultimate fulfillment in. I can actually appreciate how others are different than me. They make different decisions. They go about life differently. And then I become one who wants to add to them. I actually want to contribute to their life in positive ways as I hope they do for mine. But my fulfillment, my joy, my completion is not dependent on it. And when they let me down, when they hurt me, I feel it. There's no question. I don't like it. I don't want it to happen again. I want to construct it better, but it doesn't end me. It's not the end-all be-all, and I can actually 
let it go. And there are boundaries to that. I mean, there are, there are limitations to all people in ways that become destructive and abusive, that there are, there are boundaries here. But just because God is ultimate doesn't mean that relationships are going to just intentionally improve. But what's going to happen is that I am going to improve. I am going to become more free. One litmus test for this, and if we just try this on right now, who are you mad at right now? Like, if you actually pause, if you want to write these down, like, let's just take a second. Who are you mad at right now? Who are you disappointed in? Who are you, who are you hurt by? Just give that some thought, some thought for a second. And with that person in mind, I think the next question is, are you hurt, disappointed, mad at because your worldview says that they were supposed to complete you? That for some reason in all of this, that they're not fulfilling you. You are not enough. I am not enough. We all have limitations and shortcomings. We have a history. And if it's that for us, why would it be any different for the other people that we're in relationship with? And here's the deal. I know for myself that when I enter into this place that I am enough, it oftentimes just goes downhill from there. That I know the most efficient way that things can be done. I have the best advice for every single situation. That everything the other person needs from our relationship, I, of course, have to offer. That I have the ability to complete them. That I don't lack in our relationship. That I don't feel, fall short of ultimate fulfillment for them. Then what happens in my marriage, I can become prideful and I can blame shift. In my family, I can become self-sufficient and critical. In my friendships, I can become independent and withdraw. And what good comes from any of this relationally. So what I'm going to do right now is we're going to pause. We're going to go into some discussion groups for about eight minutes. Um, Kelly is going to break us, and we're just going to reflect on a couple of questions. And wherever you're at this morning, however much you want to dialogue around this, great. Uh, I would encourage you to, to step into it. Um, if you, you normally don't talk, then talk a little bit. If you normally talk a lot, talk a little bit less. Uh, you know, kind of find a balance, share the mic. Embrace some silence here. This is not a place of answers, but a little bit of self-discovery. I'm going to give us our two questions. Kelly's going to post them in the chat, and then our breakout facilitators also have them. But just take about eight minutes, and we're going to discuss two things. In what ways do you desire to be enough for yourself? And what about for others? And how could not being enough change the way you relate with others? We're going to break into those groups. You're going to have some dialogue. And then I'm going to give us an application and just a little bit more to wrap up. And then we'll move into our time of communion. So let's go ahead and Kelly, let's go into breakout groups. Well, I trust your uh, time of just discussion was fruitful. Uh, I don't think we walk away out of discussion with more answers or the right way, but I know even in our discussion, you almost can just come away with more questions. Uh, and I just want to encourage you to continue to press into that of what, what God might be stirring up in any of this rambling that I'm giving us um, and just walk out of here and just finding ways to be more open. Because I think the reality in this is that as we look at this, I just want to just remind each of us that your parents are not enough for you. Your, your children are not enough for you. Your spouse is not enough for you. Your friends are not enough for you. And you are not enough for them. But there is good news. Because although you are not enough, although I am not enough, God is enough. And in the, when we can step into the space to see that we are not enough, only then can God's enoughness be magnified for all of us. I love what Paul also says in 2 Corinthians. He says, But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. 
This is God saying, my power is made perfect in weakness. Paul says, therefore, I'll boast all the more gladly about my weakness so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness and insults and hardships and persecutions and difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. But it's not because you are enough. It's because God is enough. And how freeing can this be? That I'm freed from having to be enough for other people. That I'm actually freeing others from having to be enough for me. And then we have this relationship that we get to just dabble in making up for the areas that we're not enough for each other, but we're ultimately finding our fulfillment in God being enough. Maybe a tool to try on this week is if we break down the constructs in which we oftentimes operate within relationships, but whenever we get mad or frustrated or let down or hurt, can we go through a little bit of a reflection? Can we go through a series of questions? And I would encourage you to start with, is it a system thing? Did they let me down? Did they hurt me because of the construct that we're in? They showed up late, but was it because of a different situation that happened? They lied to me, but because of, was it a pressure somewhere else? Or whatever happened, is there more going on than just this relationship? Second, is it human behavior? Oftentimes we objectify people and they're, they're now boiled down to the one thing that they did to not fulfill us. But can we look through the lens and just say that you're human? <laughs> you fall short. But we don't want that for the people that are closest in our lives. We want them to be perfect. How dare they not be perfect? And then maybe move to, is it them? Is this something that I would love to dialogue, to construct, to work with, but then to find grace in? And I, I think what ends up happening is that the more we are aware of God's grace when we are not enough, then we become more humble. We become more prayerful. We become more thankful and patient and gracious and content. And these are the things that change relationships. And are not those the things that actually change the world? That by people of God, as we look to Him to be enough for us, it actually infiltrates the rest of our relationships and we just find more freedom and joy in them because we're not contingent on one another to fulfilling each other. This is the kind of thing that actually changes neighborhoods and cities and the world. And I believe that Jesus wants us to recognize our weakness and our limitations. And that's what I hope you hear this morning. That when I say you are not enough, that it's just an identification to say, you know what, I have limitations. I have shortcomings. That also means that other people have limitations. Other people have shortcomings. But when we recognize this, when we drop the thing that we need to be enough, when we're not self-sufficient and independent and prideful, God invites us to bring these limitations and weaknesses to Him. And He supplies what we lack. That when I am helpless, God is my helper. That when I am weak, he is my strength. When I'm incomplete, Jesus is my righteousness. When I am hopeless, Jesus is my hope. Imagine those things. Just again, moving into your marriage right now. Imagine those things sustaining the, the relationships within your family right now. Imagine those things taking over the thing that you're holding against your friend right now. No, you are not enough. But you are chosen. These are the things that God says to us. You are loved. You are wanted, you are forgiven, you are adopted, you are redeemed, and you are restored. We are not enough, but Jesus is more than enough, and that's all that we need. And as followers of Jesus, people of God that are here this morning, maybe the thing for us to do is to grasp this, to, to actually reach for it and say, God, I want to find more fulfillment in you, and I want to stop holding other people to be enough for me. I want to find freedom in my relationships. And if you're here this morning and not sure what to make of God and Jesus and trying to figure this thing out, maybe it's a decision to say, I want that. That I want to pursue these things where I don't have to be enough anymore. Because he is enough. We invite that in. In our relationships, I pray that this morning that we live from the truth that we are intrinsically, inherently enough. That in God, we have been made to be enough, but extrinsically, the things that we do in relationship, we are not enough. But may we live from the, 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 just the truth that we are enough 
intrinsically. And may that bring freedom to our relationships to operate with grace and joy and love, even when we are let down by others. That is my prayer this morning.